Then his, so, name, then his name would be Bacon Gordon Levitt, uh, just, uh, just, <laughs> just as a surname. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, that's before the music. <laughs> Voltage Orbiting Headquarters, this is show 100, can you believe it? We've done 100. I know, the definition of not pod fading. Yeah, yeah, is, there you uh, go. So who was we, it who said we were probably going to pod fade? I forget who it was. was but, it Ken uh, Fallon? Genu- genuinely don't remember the memory has faded. Right, because we've been doing it for so long. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think it was Ken Fallon, so... Uh, we have not pod faded, a, we're in triple digits now, so... Um, that was a much, fallacious... Yes. Accusation. Um, it, was. it was. So, I'm Stuart Langridge. I am John O'Bacon. And I am Jeremy. Yes. I think they, it's, we're 100 episodes in. I don't know that we need to intro ourselves. I, 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 this is like the, you know, previously on the West Wing things, where every now and again they put in a bit oh. explaining who they are. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well, just so everybody knows, Jeremy and I are actually on the road. We're in Los Angeles at the Open Source Summit, which we will be talking about later on. But the reason why the audio isn't as pristine and beautiful as it normally is is because we are both barking into a dustbin right now uh, yeah. to record this. So uh, bear with us for the obviously language sounds as, as wonderful as ever because he's at Castle Language. Yes, um, yeah. yes, he is. So it's, during this auspicious event, not only we would talk about the Open Source Summit, but for the first time in a very long time, two of us are actually in the same room, and it's been a little bit of a different experience. It has, yeah. So we're we're sat at a table here. Sharing one microphone, and I can hear myself th- through the mic, <laughs> through the earphones. So it's been a little bit disconcerting. <laughs> and then I hear Jono say something, and then one sixteenth of a second later, I hear it through my headphones again. So it's been, <laughs> yeah. And, and to make it's been a little worse, disoriented, I'll be honest. Yeah, and to make matters worse, we've got two Stuart languages because we're in front of two different laptops. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's like double language all the time. <laughs> Sounds like a perfectly so, yeah. fun Friday evening to me. So, yeah, and we're also, in addition to talking about um, uh, the event that we're at, we're also going to talk about uh, Hit Record. Uh, Joseph uh, Gordon Levitt, who is a, you, I'm sure he needs no introduction, well known movie actor, uh, did a keynote at the event, and he's got this really cool site called uh, Hit Record. We're going to get into that and what it is and how it works, and maybe uh, some bad voltage related stuff that we could do on it. Yes. And now. Two thirds live from the live at LA. Bad voltage. You know what it's time for? It is time for. It's time for some news. It is time for some news. Speak All right. News. Well, uh, Jeremy and I have been very busy this week working we have. at a conference, um, so we should not go first. Okay. Because fine. we're probably in the. Well, I don't know about Jeremy. But we're probably in the process of finding news as we speak. <laughs> That's <laughs> cheating. Um, no, no there, actually, loads and loads and loads of stuff has happened. Um, so the first thing um, I was going to talk about is uh, Blueborn, which is a Bluetooth attack. Uh, it's, okay. it's, 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 it's actually not really a Bluetooth attack. It's a little brand. Uh, they, they, they put together, um, they collected together a bunch of Bluetooth attacks on different platforms. And, okay. just bu- and just bundled them all up into essentially one executable or whatever. So you can run this and everything is vulnerable to it. And this is remote code execution or whatever, uh, or at least a denial of service. So uh, everything apart from iOS 10 is vulnerable. But right. again, again, that's not because they found one weakness in in Bluetooth as a whole, it's because they've got a Windows exploit and they've got a Linux exploit and they've got an Android exploit and whatever, right. you know. They're cross-platform. Um, yeah, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah. They are cross, they're cross-platform Bluetooth exploitation. But it is kind of worrying. It's, um, if nothing else, um, you can crash the Bluetooth stack on a lot of these platforms. So the, um, the Ubuntu uh, kernel, for example, had some hardening option turned on. So... It doesn't allow remote code execution, but it does allow 
you to crash the Bluetooth stack and denial of service. Um, right. A, a million billion IoT devices which are all controlled over Bluetooth and have the Linux stack and don't have this thing turned on. Remote code execution for you. Android, remote code execution for you. Windows, remote code execution for you. Um, I don't right. know about macOS. I know iOS 10 is not vulnerable. Um, but right. mm. iOS less than 10 is. They, uh, they, they found a, an iOS 9 exploit in Leap and all this kind of thing. Um, right. Again, I mean, really, this is just a... They, they've essentially bundled together a collection of different exploits for different platforms and then giving it a cool name. But nonetheless, right. it is kind of worrying because the reason people are like, oh, my God, what a big deal, is because it's a completely over-the-air attack. Right. right. Um, there is nothing stopping you just sticking a box in Times Square and attacking everyone's phone as they walk past. Yeah, true. And with Bluetooth 5 supporting meshing, it could have been worse. Than yeah, Bluetooth. yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, they, the people who did it, they called Armis, I think. Um, they said it would have been relatively easy to put together essentially a worm. Which uh, right. comp- which compromises the device and then uses that goes on to compromise other devices. A few other people have gone. No, 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 that's not anywhere near as easy as you're saying it is. But equally, <laughs> it could well be. So slightly worrying. So the point here is, unless you're using Bluetooth, turn it off. Would probably right. be a good idea. Um, and next time someone says to you, uh, "What do I need Bluetooth for?" Say, "I wish I'd bought a phone with a headphone uh, with a headphone jack in it." Because <laughs> as far as I could tell, no one's ever man in the middle the wire on my headphones. <laughs> and if they did, I'd probably notice. <laughs> well, and if they got away with it, good for them. They deserve it. At that point. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, increasingly, um, a lot of people are like, just turn off Bluetooth. What do you need it for? And the answer is to listen to music. Apparently, if you've got a phone released in the last six months. Well, the thing is, as well, is it's weird. I never ever thought of Bluetooth as something I was particularly interested in. But now, increasingly, like, you know, I'm, I'm moving more and more stuff over to using Bluetooth, like because I don't want cables. I want Bluetooth keyboards and 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 whatever else. Yeah. The one thing I don't like the idea of is Bluetooth headphones, but I, that's a completely emotional reaction. These idiots who basically say, "Well, you know, the quality of the audio is not quite so good." They're right, right? But I don't need, you know, um, a, a 96k, you know, audio file experience when I'm, you know, on the or, go. Or I just, <laughs> when you're on the bus, yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. I just want it to sound better than a PC speaker. So, so, yeah. So, I mean, but it's. I think more and more people are going to be using Bluetooth, particularly as you know. It turns out that the headphone jack is going the way of the dinosaur. So, apparently. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, the, the the point there is basically, unless you're using Bluetooth, turn it off. If you do use it to listen to headphones or whatever, then you may want to turn it on at that point and then turn it off afterwards. But um, there seem to be patches coming out for everything, and I mean, um, the the Ubuntu kernel's already patched, and that'll be right. That uh, release soon. Um, Android, they've they've got a patch out there. Quite how long the, that takes? Is it to in show the September up. update or no? Uh, it's in. It's either already out in some kind of security update, or it's coming out in the next one. Yeah. Um, but obviously, there is a big distinction between this comes out and it comes out and it arrives on your phone. Sure. Right, right. Unless, unless you've got a Pixel, I'm sure Jono will be fine. I'm sure the ninety nine point nine 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 four people percent of people who don't have a Pixel <laughs> <laughs> will not be fine. But yes, so yeah. watch, out, watch out for Bluetooth. Well, in other um, in other non iPhone eight news, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to it. We'll get to it. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about something very quickly, which is um, the Linux Foundation announced. Um, uh, we're, uh, obviously, Jeremy and I are at uh, the Open Source Summit. They announced a project called the Chaos Project, which I thought I'd share here, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, so basically, the point of this is that is it's essentially a Linux Foundation project that's focused on creating analytics and metrics to help define community health, right? So this is a bunch of people coming together, such uh, heavyweights as the Eclipse Foundation, uh, Laval University, Lenaro, Mozilla, OpenStack, Polytechnic Montreal, Batergia, Red Hat, Source Labs, Software Sustainability Institute, Symphony Software Foundation, John O'Bacon Consulting. Hang on, John O'Bacon <laughs> Consulting, yes. I am. Yeah, so obviously the reason why I mention it is because I'm involved and I don't really. Uh, well, that's, that's enough of a reason. Uh, <laughs> this does just confirm that anything you say on the show is 
something to do with that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Oh. Oh, oh, also, this thing, as far as I can tell, right, it's Chaos, C-H-A-O-S-S. And the OSS, yeah, they get a good name. The OSS is open source software. Yeah, but when you say they've got a good name, I don't think they went, let's do this thing, and then thought up a name for it. This gives the very, very strong impression that they thought up the name first and then invented a foundation which fit the acronym. Now, right. who do we know who thinks up names for stuff first and then invents something for it to happen? <laughs> <laughs> and this, um, I think, explains John O'Bacon Consulting's involvement. <laughs> that'll be johnobaconconsulting.com. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, it's, it, I, think, I, think, uh, I think that's a fair and reasonable point. I mean, this, I think this acronym is kind of ridiculous, but whatever. Um, I think part of the issue they're going to have with the name is if you send someone to chaos.community, that exists spelled correctly and it's like a netflix chaos right. engineering thing <laughs> so the, the domain name maybe wasn't thought through well yeah i mean it's i think that the the focus of this project is actually something i'm pretty excited about because one of the things that bugs me a little bit is i think that um there are people who are there's an obsession right now about creating dashboards of metrics and yeah. the problem in my mind is people are uh, are more interested in having all of the numbers than actually measuring the right things. And they're invariably, and I was talking about this in my talk the other day, they, they measure the actions such as, you know, post to a forum or submissions of a pull request, but they're not actually validating those actions. They're not looking at quality. It's just quantity. And to me, that sets a dangerous precedent. So, you know, Bitergia have been around for a bit and the Bitergia team, are a, pretty, a bunch of nice guys, and they've, they've been doing some decent work. But I think it's kind of needing to go beyond the scope of what they've been doing. So I think it's good that, you know, Red Hat and Eclipse and all these other organizations are involved. Um, it's really early days. I sat, I'm on the governance board and I sat in the governance meeting early this week. And it's, it's literally just like getting the housekeeping in place. But I think it's good that we're seeing something like this. We'll see if it's, we'll have to see, obviously, whether it bears fruit. It's a big problem. But I think there is a real appetite for better metrics. So, uh, and, 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 and being able to, convert the understand the health of an open source project and particularly convert that into a language that businesses understand which typically is money and obviously right. that's not going to work well here so <laughs> yes well, i thought it was interesting when I, I went to the launch uh talk whatever it was the concerns that people had with uh, measuring value were kind of interesting to hear mm. yeah so um you know i think it's great we'll uh, we'll have to see see what happens but yeah stay tuned all right mr garcia what have you got? So, is, it iPhone, is it iPhone 8 related news? It's, it's not iPhone 8 <laughs> related news. Uh, let's go with the Equifax incident that happened, right? And I, I, you would almost had to be under a rock to not hear that uh, Equifax had a little bit of a breach there. They said roughly 143-ish million uh, consumers' personal data was booched. And it looks like they got potentially everything up to full address social security number driver's license number and potentially credit card numbers right so i i'd uh, be clear and they seem to be handling it spectacularly poorly yes it's not well, well, I mean, handled well. even before we get on to their legendarily poor handling of this situation. 143 million is as far as I can tell anyone who's ever even wandered near the idea of purchasing anything ever since the beginning of time in America. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it's fair. I, I mean, this is an absolutely gargantuan data breach of a company yeah. who no one wants to deal with and everyone has to, who are yes. already the worst people on earth. When, um, <laughs> In, in my previous flat, he's, right? he's, he's supportive of Equifax. <laughs> um, uh, in uh, the previous flat that I lived in, um, when I uh, applied for the mortgage to buy this place, they said, oh, there's something weird about your credit record. And I went, okay, that's not good. <laughs> and then looked mm. into it and, and had to spend days and days and days um, sending emails and on hold and... Uh, waiting, waiting for response. And obviously, you can't send an email and get an email back. You've got to send an email and then get a response back in their stupid thing that you have to log into, which half the time doesn't work and doesn't work if you block cookies and all this kind of thing, right? Total nightmare. And then it turned out the reason uh, my credit record was problematic is because they thought I lived in the flat I lived in and also a different flat in the same block. And I said, <laughs> obviously, I didn't do that. That didn't happen. And they went, no, 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 you did. I, was, I bloody didn't. I didn't do that. And it took me a good two or three weeks to get it sorted out and work out. 
I'm like, I didn't live there. I've never lived there. I've never been anywhere near it. What's happened is someone somewhere has written down my address wrong on something that I've bought, and then it's gone in your stupid, all-encompassing 143 million people database, which you just don't care about the security of. Um, it's a game <laughs> skin sort of so they're a nightmare. And now yeah. the best thing is, as Jeremy was saying, how they've handled this. Tell them about the pin numbers thing for anyone who hasn't heard. <laughs> I didn't. What's the pin numbers then? Have you not seen this? Um, when, no. you, when you go, um, you they they've set up a website um, to check whether you've been compromised. Ah, oh, I did see this. Yeah. Right? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And first of all, the website is something like Equifax check if you've been compromised twenty seventeen dot com, which looks like the biggest fish <laughs> thing ever. I can't wait for the twenty eighteen version. <laughs> well, it's like, I mean, it, it looks like the sort of thing that uh, that fishing people would send you. But then when you sign in, they give you some kind of a pin in so you can sign back in or to, re- to register your account or whatever and that pin is the date and time you checked that's literally it <laughs> <laughs> all right it, it, did they have a thing where if you put in your information and your name it said you might have been compromised but if you just put in random data it said the same exact thing yeah so uh, yeah i see that uh, it, it's it's nuts. I mean, the, the the pin numbers. Um, if you so if you go there and freeze your credit report, like uh, right now, so it's ten thirty five for you. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So your pin number <laughs> would be o nine for September thirteen for the day, um, seventeen for the year, ten thirty five. That's the secure pin they issue you. <laughs> that's um that's great that's a little, <laughs> little insight into their programming uh, um, i didn't re- i didn't realize that they built their site based upon reading my book php and my sq <laughs> my php and my sql book <laughs> um Equifax said while we have confidence in the current system we understand and appreciate that consumers have questions about how pins are currently generated <laughs> now to be clear no one's got a question everyone knows how they're being generated they're a timestamp. We're engaged <laughs> in a process that will provide consumers a randomly generated pin. We expect this change to be effective within 24 hours. So it's good that they've now realised that when you get a pin, it shouldn't just be what time it is. Oh, it's a, it's a bad day at Black Rock for Equifax, isn't it? Can you imagine what it must be like internally there? It doesn't, make, it doesn't make any difference, Oof. though. Um, this is the point. They don't have to compete in the market. No, everyone right. already hated them, and it didn't yeah. matter. So no, this is everyone already them. doesn't like Equifax, and it's not like you can opt out of them. You yeah, can't say, oh, I want my credit stuff to be done by a different credit checking agency. They're basically the only game in town. They're like, yeah. you know, it's nuts. They are, but I, I mean, this has got to have a negative impact in the future. There's got to be all kinds of questions going to be raised now around such a dependency on one organization. This, I don't think they're going to sit back and say, ah, it's all right. Who cares? It's, it's only us in town. I mean, uh, this is not going to be good. They're going to. They're I mean, going to be panicking. Experian, and there's three of them, right? So mm, we shall. We shall, we shall see. We shall see. Um, but yes, um, uh, one other piece of news, which is um, all terribly early yet, but this is, is it iPhone eight related. It's not iPhone eight related. Okay, <laughs> it is phone related. <laughs> um, okay. but but this is this is actually a picture of actual phone technology that I want, right? Oh, um, so it's the size of a postage stamp, then. Well, first of all, yes, yes. Did you get the jellyfish yet? Um, they, um, someone, uh, uh, there's a Google faculty research program, uh, and they have built a um, a cell phone system on chip card, right? Uh, and they can make Skype calls with it, things like that. Um, and it's powered by radio waves. No battery required at all. Hang on, explain. <laughs> um, it, the fo- it, they've said the phone receives power from sunlight, right? So solar powered, or RF waves sent from a nearby base station. Um, so, with a technique called backscattering, the phone can make a voice call by modifying and reflecting the same waves back to the base station. So, it's not. It, this is not just a random battery which you can uh, power off radio waves, right? It, it's useful for this specific purpose, but they can make Skype voice calls, for example. Um, and it uses three microwatts of power. So you can't use this. You, you can't just go and buy one of these batteries and stick it in your pixel and suddenly it works. Like it's only for a specific type of thing, but nonetheless, that's amazing. That is nuts. <laughs> 
that's really, really, so you, really impressive. Um, so uh, they, so they, you they, just they, basically they, Spider Man power out to people. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Um, they. Um, the the other nice thing about it is because they don't you don't need to do much. It it, it works on essentially the way existing cell towers work. So most right. cell phones could just put this in. So you could make a phone call even on a completely dead phone. But don't you have to power the base station? Yeah, but cell towers already powered, right? Oh, so it's not a special base station. It can be an existing cell no, tower. No, um, technology-wise. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's not clear to me whether it's exactly an existing cell tower or it's a cell tower, but it's a little bit different. But it's not a radical new reinterpretation oh. of the technology, no. Um, but either you can use it on existing cell towers or they could retrofit this to existing cell towers very easily and cheaply. Hmm. But that's Jesus. fab, you know? I wonder if this That'd is... would be good for d- in disaster situations. Especially. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll just have this and an e-ink display, and then I'll be just fine. Then, Jeremy, you'll finally be in a position where you can have a battery and you can plug it in on a Friday, and it'll last till Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jeremy's essential that phone... the dream. Jeremy's essential phone is performing very well, but we were saying last night we can't de- determine yet whether it's the battery's actually really good or whether it's because the phone is a week old. It's just because it's yeah. new, man. Everyone's phone... batteries are so good. Yeah, yeah. so good. <laughs> but at the end of the day yesterday, full day at a conference, used it quite a bit. It was at, like, what, 91%, right. I think? Right. Yeah, talk, talk to me in three months. Phenomenal. <laughs> it's kind of like dating and then getting married. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I'm referring to other people, not me and my wife. Uh, oh, so. you massive chicken, honestly. <laughs> I love my wife. She's brilliant. Uh, <laughs> yes, so, end of the news. I actually genuinely do, because she listens to Bad Fox. I just want to be very clear. She's smart, she's intelligent, she's beautiful. That's all, that's, that's enough, okay. So wait, after all, uh, th- th- not to change the subject on you, all, th- <laughs> all true. Uh, after all the alluding to iPhone 8 news, we're not doing any eight iPhone 8 news? It would be comedy if we just ignore it, wouldn't it? I think, I think we yeah. ignore it. Some phone's out from Apple, check it out. <laughs> yeah, whatever, man. I mean, there's the X as well. Yeah, I, I, I don't know why you call a thing iPhone X, but the... <laughs> <laughs> Phone X sounds like a pe- pe- guitar. Pe- pe- people are hooked on it. Ha-ha. <laughs> Wow. I don't know if I can continue. So, Jeremy and I are at the Open Source Summit in Los Angeles, uh, which is a Linux Foundation event, um, of which there are many Linux Foundation events. I think there's like 150 a year or something like that. Um, Really? Yeah, so we thought there's a lot. There's an LF event one every two days. Well, uh, it's like one for every foundation they have. Right. <laughs> so there's a lot of events. Um, but this is what... So the background here is that there used to be an event called LinuxCon. Um, and it was kind of almost a little bit like, a bit like OSCON, general purpose open source event. Um, they started having these kind of sub pieces, like sub parts of, or I guess you could say companion events that were part of LinuxCon, such as Cloud Open. Um and uh, and what they've done is they've essentially changed LinuxCon to be the Open Source Summit. Yes. And that's now got four events that are part of it. One is LinuxCon. Uh, the second one is uh, ContainerCon, which I'm sure you can guess what these two are, are about. The third one is the Cloud Open event. And then the fourth one actually is one that I'm running, which is called the Open Community Conference, uh, which is, you know, talks about community management and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so far, I think it's been, I don't know about you, Jeremy, I think it's been pretty good so far. It's been, it's, I yeah. think generally the, you know, it's, the content's been good. The keynotes have been pretty good. Um, <clears throat> Joseph Gordon-Levitt was speaking. Dan Lyons was speaking. Uh, I forget his name from IBM was, was speaking. Um, yeah, it's been, what, what do you think? That's been good. So... I don't yeah. know, I mean, what's, what's the, what's the overall vibe of the thing? I mean, I'm looking at it, it seems... Sort of semi corporate. It's that- not semi corporate. <laughs> it, it's massively corporate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was being polite a bit, but yeah. <laughs> um, so, but do you think it's useful for, you know, the, well, the sort of people who listen to this show rather than necessarily the sort of people who are looking to uh, embed their massively transformational purpose? So they can cross the line? <laughs> so they can. <laughs> I don't know, you, 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 you tell me. Well, um, 
I mean, uh, least, who's, who's the ideal? Who's the ideal delegate? It's it's interesting because you know obviously with different types of events you get different audiences, right? So at yeah. Oscon, and different vibes in addition, yeah. Different like at Oscon, you'd, you'd you'd always get like a lot of the what I would say the classic open source crowd, the people who've been around for a long time, the people who were in the you know in, into Apache and Perl and whatever else. Like the O'Reilly click would obviously be there. I think there is a different audience at, at, at the at this event. I mean. There's definitely, there's a lot of people from big companies, from Microsoft, from Veritas, from IBM, all those kinds of companies. But there is also, I mean, there are like, what I would say is the kind of crowd who would listen to Bad Voltage. You know, Matthew Garrett's here, Sarah Sharp is here, um, you know, a bunch of other people. So it's definitely, I think it angles more towards open source in business. There's no doubt about it. Um, but, uh, and there's also like the kernel summits here. There's a security summit that's here as well. That's happening really, I think from, thir- I think on Thursday and Friday. So after the main yeah. event, so. Kernel plumbers is here. Right. So it's like, it, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I'd say it's kind of probably 80% more corporate and maybe 20% or more, uh, you know, more like kind of community. And I think they're trying to change the balance of that a little bit. I think part of the reason why we're doing the Open Community Conference is to kind of reseat that a little bit. So, Oh, no, okay. No, that's, that's that's fair play then. I mean, yeah. That's a, so both of you were speaking. Yeah. How, well, did it go, well, how, did, how did it go? Have you done yours yet? Mine was yesterday. Oh, I, th- oh, bollocks. I was in a meeting when you were doing it. Really? Mm-hmm. You inconsiderate git. You didn't even show up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, yeah, I, well, no, basically. It's <laughs> 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 I have no excuse. It's bad voltage How did it go? supportiveness right there. That went well. Yeah. A lot of good feedback, a very engaged audience. Which tell, is tell, good. Tell, the, tell the people what you were talking about. Yes. Uh, I was talking about the different tools available to build out your community and what the pros and cons are and when you should use each. For those people who are listening to this who haven't seen Jeremy speak, he's an excellent speaker. Um, he did a, what was that? Linux in five minutes, whatever it was, 20 years. 25 of, years of Linux yeah. in five minutes. That was brilliant. So. Cheers, pal. Um, were, yeah. were the talks videoed? Only the keynotes, I believe. Yeah. Actually, the keynotes were live streamed. I don't even know if you can watch them. Yeah, anything. I don't know. That I don't know. <coughs> I imagine they'll probably put them online. I'm curious, actually, how they do this, because I know with O'Reilly, I think you get them if you bought a ticket. I think you get access to them if you bought a ticket, but I'm not sure if O'Reilly published the Oscon talks generally for people to see. I don't know what they do. At you the either other. need to buy a ticket or you need to be a Safari member. Ah, because O'Reilly are very much like turning into more of a media company. I think like with yes. training and yeah. books and all that kind of yes. stuff. So. Yeah, 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 very definitely. No, no, that's interesting. I mean, um, if if the um, if any of your talks were videoed and are published, then we'll link them in the show notes. Yes. People could people, but, people could enjoy the, the the Garcia and Bacon experience. That sounds very sexual. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so would, would would you go again? Uh, he's running a track here, so I imagine the answer to that is yes. Not only would we go again, but we will be at the event in Prague. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. We will go to this event. Again, next in month. five weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to set these things up so you can knock them down, right? <laughs> yeah, you're doing a good job. Uh, no, I mean, I, 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 this is for me is, is one of the staple events. I think one of the problems in my mind right now is that the event space is a bit oversubscribed. So, for example, yeah. for me, I work generally in open source, right? So I don't only work in containers or the kernel or anything like that. So for me... The top priority events are OSCON, Open Source Summit, both America and uh, Europe. There is an Open Source Summit in China, and I think there's one in Japan as well, but I don't tend to go to those. Um, there is All Things Open in Raleigh, which is brilliant. Yeah. Um, and that is a lot of events, right, to keep busy with. But there's also, you know, KubeCon and the Apache, uh, you know, events, and there's all kinds of so, – and DebConf and Guadec. It's like, Sky. where do you tr- – Yes, well, scale. Scale's a staple. <laughs> like, yeah. But if you start including those, there's oh. Self, there's... Oh, the, oh Self, Texas, yeah. Texas Linux Fest, Ohio Linux Fest. Og Camp, uh, yeah. Linux Fest Northwest. I mean, there's yeah. a, a ton of events. There's, there's, there's so much in it. I find it... There's too many right well, now. Alan and I had kind of talked the potential for starting, I don't know what it would be called, Bail... Uh, the Buffalo Area Linux Expo. <laughs> oh, but like, like, do you need another event? And we're not. It would be nice if there's one in New York State. Yeah, I think there should be. But 
I would love if there was a. I, mean, I, I, I think there's a distinction between events where you you sort of doing it for the area. So in theory, scale is that in practice it isn't, and everyone goes from everywhere. But things like um, uh, a, a bunch of other ones, a higher Linux fest, that sort of thing. Um, if there's one in your sort of area, then you go to that one and don't go to the others necessarily. And it would be nice right. if, if there was bail. Whereas well, something I, like Oscon, I think the nice thing about something like Ohio Linux Fest is it allows people who might not have the budget at work, yeah, to go to the local one. They might not be able to fly yeah. up to scale, even yeah. though it is you know value wise is a great value, definitely worth it. Yeah, but it's not everyone has that opportunity. So yeah. having those local events, I think, is great in that regard. Whereas something like Oscon, the idea is there's one and everyone comes to it from all over. So that yeah. that kind of collides with big stuff like uh, like where you are now, Open Source Summit, for example. Yeah. The other thing as well is, um, the, like, one thing I'm really looking forward to about going to Prague is that it's a different crowd, Yeah. right? So, like, <clears throat> I go to a lot of the events in the U.S., and Jeremy does as well. You see the same people and over, over and over again. Yeah. And on one hand, that's great because we get to hang out with our friends and you get to see people you enjoy spending time with. But on the other hand, it's nice to meet new people. That's one of the reasons why I love going. I, while I go occasionally, I've only been twice in the last 15 years, uh, going, going to LCA, um, oh, yeah. you know, Linux.conf.au, because it's a totally different audience. I mean, everybody, yeah. they live on the other side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's brilliant because you meet new people, you get to see new things. And so, but yeah, it's it's a struggle. And I think it's getting more and more competitive now. I mean, there, there is no doubt in my mind that OSCON and, and the Open Source Summit are very much competing with each other. And for me, I'd get it both. Um, okay. But... But this is a good kind of event for you specifically because it is a little more corporate focused. If yeah. you're looking for clients as a consultant, it's yeah. a very good. The hallway track is very good in that regard. Yeah. No, it's really valuable in that regard. But, you know, if you work in containers or well, if you work in like Kubernetes, for example, I mean, you could go do 50 events a year. <laughs> <laughs> Easily. So, but no, I think it's good. The The other thing which I want to share briefly, which I thought was really encouraging uh, on a, on the note of diversity is um uh so for the open community conference you know the one here in la is the first one and we've got the one in prague and we had the call for papers and um we had over 120 submissions for the u.s event which was way more than i expected and over 85 for the prague event oh, nice. which is brilliant and we pick about 35 like i think it's about 32 talks and about i think two boffs the one thing i was really encouraged to see with both events is real diversity of men and women and people from all over the world. Lots of people submitting from Asia, from India, which I thought was cool. So I think we're starting to see like, you know, the needle change a little bit in terms of, you know, not just the same bunch of white people from America kind of submitting talks. I'm, I'm pleased to see that. And one of the things we tried to do is to make sure we had a good balance of that, obviously in, in, in who we picked. So that, that, that was encouraging to me. The other thing I will say, <clears throat> which I shared with a, a friend of ours, is and this is a top tip for if you're submitting a paper to a conference one of the things i learned was a lot of the people who submitted papers to the open community conference the the talks were very generic open source talks like you know 10 recommendations for doing open source well or you know the future of the of, of open source that kind of stuff right yeah the things that were way more interesting to me were things that were much more specialist like how to do something very specific because there were, a, you know, t probably at least over half of the talks submitted were very generic. So I would say if you're submitting talks to a conference, submit something a bit more specific because I think it stands out more, which yeah. I thought was interesting because for me, I tend to submit fairly general talks because I want to cover as much ground as possible. And I feel like it's more likely to be accepted because it's of more broader interest. Well, I, think, I think that's the point, though, right? Um, a lot of people right. would say, but if I submit this specific thing, they'll go, but that's only useful to a specific audience, therefore you don't get to go on stage. Yeah, exactly. So this so, is why people do general talks, right? Because if, it, um, if, you, say, if you do a talk about um, this is the future of open source, then you get a reputation as a thought leader and it's applicable right. to every conference. So that's why people want to submit those things. I'm not saying it's right. And I wish right. people didn't do it either. But you're the first person I've heard su suggest that doing it is actually more likely to get you picked rather than just more likely to be a better talk, which is not right. the same thing. Right, exactly. So that, that was really insightful to me. I mean, it's kind of obvious when you think about it, but it was insightful to me. So I definitely recommend for, for those of you who are speaking at conferences, submit things that are a bit more specialist. 
um, not super specialist. I mean, right. but um, so things that are of a general interest to that audience, but definitely things that are more focused on a specific topic because I, I think I, you want to get paid. I think this is a good topic to discuss in general because, right. you know, for those of you that submit talks to conferences a lot, when you don't get accepted, there's very little or usually no feedback. feedback yeah. So it's difficult to iterate on the process. So yeah. getting that kind of feedback, I think, is good. We should, yeah. yeah, we should. We should talk about like how to maybe just how to yeah how to get into conferences as a speaker yeah, yeah no that be I, I did um, and also how to make the most of conferences when you get there yeah so. um uh, well a uh, chance for a tiny little plug then uh Jess Rose who uh, at least John knows and I think oh, yeah she's brilliant um Jerry might do as well she's doing a thing called the pursuit podcast and one of the things that that has is uh, she's doing a whole big long series about getting into public speaking for people who are just into development. And there's been a bunch of people. Um, I, 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 I talked on it, but the, the conversation I had isn't out yet. And a, a, a yeah. bunch of other people talk about, you know, how you prepare a talk and how you get it accepted and uh, the sort of way you should go about it and public speaking in general and so on. So it's, it's interesting. Because I think there are, you do get the impression that people are crying out for that sort of knowledge that we've all just kind of internalised, right? Yeah. But people don't talk about it much. And, it would, and it's really good to get the word out to people a bit more. Well, the other thing as well is I think when people go to conferences, <clears throat> if particularly if you want to accomplish something in particular, like if you're going to just hang out, that's one thing. But if you're going, for example, because you want to kind of become more well-known or you want to build a business or whatever it might be, there's just certain things, certain ways of going to a conference that are beneficial. Like one of the, there's one small example in my mind. I think one of the big mistakes that people make is that they go and spend their entire day in sessions. Like the, for me, the hallway track is by far the most valuable piece, you know, yes, go and see some talks if you want to, <clears throat> but going to the booth crawl, um, going to the evening events, that's really valuable, particularly if you want to just get to know people. And I think part of the reason why people don't do it who are new is because it's kind of nerve wracking. If you don't know anyone, it's it a can bit definitely scary. Be intimidating. If you walk into a giant room, there's a thousand people right. there and you don't know anyone. Yeah, so, and particularly you're very, very outgoing. And particularly, there's people who you you already know. Like if you see like Linus Torvalds walking around and Greg KH and Jim Zemin, it can be nerve wracking because you feel like you're out of your depth. But that is, I think, how a lot of these relationships get formed. And then, for me, in my mind, like when you go to a conference and you know people, that's when it's really fun because yeah. you just, you know, it you feel part of the scene at that point. So, but yeah, we should talk about this. Yeah. Actually, see, bad, bad voltage would not exist if the, for not the hallway track because we yeah. met at a conference. We met at a conference. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is very, very true. And Jeremy nearly punched the guy. Um, <laughs> that's, a sto- that's a story for another time. <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, I'd say this has been pretty cool. Um, I think the Linux Foundation have done a decent job. It's, it's a really well organized event as well. And one of the things I like as well is they have a travel bursary uh, to send people out, and they also provide free childcare. Yeah, which is cool. So um, we, of course, didn't bring our child. He's he can stay at home. So yesterday, um, the first keynote at the Open Source Summit was from Joseph Gordon Levitt. Some of you may know him as the actor in Inception and also Snowden. Yeah. Um, in fact, one thing I didn't know about him is that he gave his um, acting fee to the ACLU. For, for doing Snowden, which I thought was yeah, quite cool. Oh, I didn't know that either, actually. Yeah, because yeah. the ACLU were primarily, um, obviously, working with Snowden around his whole situation. So, uh, which, uh, and uh, for those of you who haven't seen Snowden, it's a fantastic movie. It's really good. So, uh, um, anyway, he was doing uh, he was doing the keynote yesterday, which was kind of cool. Um, and he was talking about something called Hit Record, which is this website that he has built with his co-founder, who they met in an off-Broadway play. Yeah. Um, and it's basically a site where people can submit, uh, where people can basically start a new project. They can say, I want to make a video. And then um, somebody might write some, might write a script and then they might, someone else might improve that script. And then they can, you know, he gave this example where they shot some green screen footage and then somebody can provide the imagery that goes behind the, you know, where the green is. Somebody can create the, the soundtrack. Somebody can do a voiceover. And it's kind of a way in which people can collaborate around building stuff. Now, we thought this might be quite interesting to talk about, but this is really broken into two areas. One is hit record itself as a site and what they're trying to do. The second piece is one of the components here is around payments and how they handle payments. And we're, 
we're going to get into, a, we'll touch on it today, but we're going to get into a much bigger discussion about payments in a future show. Um, but yeah, yes. I just think it, one of the things that was, was, was kind of interesting as, as a bit of, well, first of all, let's first of all talk about the site itself and then we'll get into the payments bit. But what do you think about this? I mean, I, first of all, his keynote was, I think a lot of us were expecting him to, you know, kind of get up and waffle a little bit about, about, you know, openness and freedom and for it to not have a lot of substance or for him to not have a lot of familiarity with our world. But I was astonished by how well he knows our world. Like he yeah. clearly understands free culture and the value of collaboration, all that kind of stuff. It was a fantastic keynote. Um, what did you think, Jeremy? I mean, bear in mind, first, will... b- 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 before you go on, um, the man is yeah. one of the best actors on earth, right? You'd expect him to give a polished performance. <laughs> so I thought it would be polished, but I didn't think I would like the content. Right. Like, no, that, that's, that's not exactly fair, it, but yeah. he... A he seems much more down to earth than I would have expected someone yeah. in his space or however you want to word that. Um, and B, like he was casually dropping GitHub references, which I just was <laughs> not anticipating. Yeah, I mean, he talked about you know he he, he mentioned Lawrence Lessig and yep. you know free culture and um, he, he's clearly read he's clearly read a lot on this on the subject. Um, and and I actually thought the in my mind it's it's funny because like you know I. I'm a musician, right? So I've, I've I've been in a room with other creative people making music, and anything that's creative, obviously, is a very opinionated process. Whether it's writing code or whether it's making music, or whatever. So they've built a platform for people to be creative across different mediums, right? So whether you're making music or whether you're writing or whether you're doing video, and he gave this example. He played this video of this woman who had an eyesight problem she you know her dad brought her some some optics and they could see the stars and all kind of and it was really well produced super well produced yeah and uh, and what's neat about it is when people um contribute um content to it if that gets used in a commercial setting they get a cut of the profits yep um which uh, which i want to dip it dick it uh, dick into <laughs> Diff, that's, that was not the right word. Uh, dip into in a bit because there's some interesting meat on that bone. But what do you think about his site? Like, what do you think about Hit Record? Because I think it's quite neat. But have you looked into it as well? Uh, I have. Um, <laughs> it was interesting because at first I thought it was primarily music rather than primarily videos. Like and so I assumed the site was called Hit Record, as in we'd like to record a hit record rather than we'd like to <laughs> press the record button. <laughs> so, interesting. Um, but then it occurred to me that it can't be that because no one calls them records anymore, granddad. And the fact that you even understood that means you are too old. But <laughs> um, the, the main question I have, I, 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 I get the idea. They, they say we're a new kind of online community working together as a production company. There's obviously a big kind of mental overlap with the sort of thing that Creative Commons have been trying to do to foster um, the sort of thing Lawrence Lessig has been talking about for years, you know, fostering a remix culture, having people get together and put things. Um, but it's never really taken off in the past. Right. Uh, I mean, th- th- there are always examples you can point at. Cory Doctorow has, you know, gone around the world on a wing and a prayer, show it, pointing out examples of. Um, times where people have done this and how they've been really great examples. But the concept as a thing has never really ignited people's interests. What right, right. What do you think is different about Hit Record? <laughs> that, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it, I, I look at it and I'm like, it says Hit Record. And I think, no, it's Hit Record. Um, what do you think is different about this? Is that what they're trying to do is the first question. I, I would say not exactly. Right. So, uh, this, so, your, so this, your, this is my question. So what are they trying to do? So I, I think he's trying to approach many of the same problems that we have, or the problem is not the right word, but many of the same items in our uh, our space, such as collaborating and community and free culture, but adding a component of fair compensation is the phrasing that he kept using. Yeah. And I think it was interesting to get a different perspective on a world we very much live in yeah, from a world we very much don't. Right. Um, so I know we're going to talk about the fair compensation bit of quite a bit in the next show. I think we're going to do a segment on, on broader around, payments. broadly around yeah. payments. And stuff. So I don't know how much we want to get into it now, but I, I think what they're trying to do is, is change the industry a little bit so that there is a, Hollywood, I would say now is not overly collaborative. Let's go with. 
Right. So I think he wants to instill that collaborative nature, that remix culture, while also keeping the component of, of getting fair compensation. Yeah. So it seems like, much like, I, he seems to have a similar worldview to me that I would rather have a bunch of millionaires, thousands of them, than one billionaire. To yeah. me, that just makes more sense. Yeah, to me. yeah I sustainable agree. And yeah. It's, it's, I mean, more egalitarian. Uh, but, yep. it, but, um, so there's kind of a distinction here, I think. Um, is the goal here primarily to give uh, the, the Creative Commons goal always seemed to be that people who wanted to do this stuff but didn't actually have a job as a movie editor in a Hollywood studio because they're hard to get and the people don't live in Los Angeles, they could get involved in remix culture. Um, but there's an alternative, which is that what he wants to do is change the industry we've got. So instead of uh, our movie producer or movie editor person working for <coughs> Universal or whatever, they they start collaborating with people on hit record. And so is is his goal to make the to make people producing movies and music and whatever to massively enlarge that community so it goes beyond what we've got existing, or is it to change the way the existing thing works? Well, so I actually, I actually, so before he did his keynote, um, there was a little bit of a gathering for some people and I, I got to meet him and spend a bit of time chatting to him. And I actually asked him about the creative commons piece. Um, and one thing I just want to say from the outset was, you know, as when you meet anyone who's as well known as him, you kind of have some preconceived notions of what they're going to be like. And also you just, you, you just don't know what they're going to be like. And one thing I have to say is his presence in stage, everybody said it seems very down to earth and yeah approachable and just chatting to him super nice guy very intelligent very very approachable it was just like chatting to someone else at the event uh, which i thought was really cool so big respect to to joseph gordon levitt for that but one of the things you know i asked him about what was interesting is that before he did his talk um um linus torvalds was there greg kh sarah novotny and and um and a few other people and and uh, they were explaining how kind of like the GPL and open source licensing works. And one of the things they said was, you know, when, when somebody creates a feature in, for example, in Linux, um, they contribute it to the community and other people can go and sell that, you know, the kernel and, and benefit from that feature. And, and, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt said, so the person who created that feature, do they get compensated for that? Do they share in the winnings? And they say, no, and not necessarily. And there are other reasons why people participate in Linux um, for career, because they work for a company that that works there, whatever. And one of the things that he, you know, he was clearly like, ah, oh, really? And one of the things that he made very clear in his in his presentation was a core, very strongly held view in him is that um, if you create something and somebody else sells it, then you should share in the money there, which is obviously a very different, uh, a very different you know, ethos to how, how it works in day to day in open source. And I asked him about the creative commons and I said, you know, have you worked at all with the creative commons? And he said, you know, we, we looked at it when we kicked off the site, but you know, they spent hours and weeks working on, uh, on their terms of service. And one of the things they found was that kind of the creative commons licensing framework didn't really match with what they were trying to do. Hmm. And I have to say on a, on a separate, and I'll stop waffling. Um, when we did severed fifth and you know, severed fifth was all about, all the music is completely creative commons and all the rest of it. Um, as we started playing with reasonably well-known bands in the Bay area, a lot of people were very uncomfortable with what we were doing because, you know, in, if you're a jobbing musician or a jobbing actor, $50 makes a lot of difference. Like it, it's not like we, we play gigs and if we didn't get paid, you know, for most of the band, we didn't, we didn't really care. It was like, whatever, you know, we've got day jobs. Um, but one of the members of our band, it was his, like, that was what he was doing. So if we didn't get, if he didn't get his $50 at the end of the night, he couldn't feed his family. So I think the creative commons world is great if you're kind of like a hobbyist. Right. But if you want to be in the entertainment industry, um, you need to get paid. And therefore something like hit record, I think is a lot more attractive because you get the exposure. It's attached to someone who's very well known in that world. Right. Um, and you get compensated, which I thought was fascinating because it's it, like Jeremy says, it's, very different to the world that we tend to live in. Yeah. One thing that definitely struck me during the talk is he's clearly given this talk a lot. It was a very polished talk. Yeah. And you could tell that the way that a lot of things were framed 
He's used to giving this to an audience that completely doesn't understand the collaboration, the free culture aspect of yeah. it, yeah. but uh, really yeah. understands the other side of it, the compensation yeah. side of it. And this was like the exact opposite. Yeah. I think he's used to giving this talk to. Yeah. So it was inter- interesting in that regard, I think. You, you, can, yeah. you can imagine him thinking, okay, so the main pitch of my talk is I've got to say to people, look, you do this thing and you don't get paid for it then, but then if someone takes a thing on, you know, we will we'll work together on it and a rising tide raises all boats. And that's a really hard sell for most people. And he comes up with that as the first sentence and everyone in, everyone in the audience there just goes, yeah, okay, great. That seems fine. Next. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. No, and I think it was good because I think it got people in the audience <laughs> genuinely thinking i mean I, like there were lo- lots of conversation afterwards where people were thinking wow he makes some really really good points particularly with the compensation piece which and, and that's part of the reason why we want to talk about payments in the next episode is because this is a big topic that we can't cover right, right here but um i think it's i think it's really neat and one of the things i also liked about what they were doing is you know they highlight community very active community members who become very well known in their community like i thought they were making a lot of good choices in the way they operate their community. But I think there's yep. also a huge amount of scope for things that they're not doing right now, which I think is neat. So, yeah. So, I, th- so, I think so, one other thing oh. this underscored, at least for me, is I think in this industry we've reached a point where whether you agree or disagree with a new perspective, I think a new perspective is refreshing. Yeah. And it kind of makes you think about things in a different way. And even at the end of the day you say, I don't agree with that perspective, I think it's healthy for our ecosystem to yeah. maybe – Allow some additional outside perspectives in. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we, we, we will talk about how, you know, we might end up, we could maybe restructure open source to work more like this in the payments section of this in the next show. But uh, hit record itself. Who's it for? Who should be getting involved? Uh, are the sort of people who listen to us going to get involved? Or is it for people who are, you know, basically trained movie editors? I think it's for anyone who is, creatively inclined it's for yeah. screenwriters poets um you know editors composers musicians voiceover artists actually when you create so the way he demonstrates it, and i've not used it myself personally but when you create a new project on there um or i think it might be called a challenge um you can actually select from a variety of different types of participation so in the same way with an open source project you can be a developer you can be a docs writer a translator Right. Within the context of this, it's, yeah, a movie, an editor, a, a musician, a, a composer, whatever it might be. And then people basically submit stuff. And the one thing he he said, it was funny, because in the, in the discussion before the, the keynote, one of the things that Jim Zemlin, who's the executive director of the Linux Foundation, said, you know, Linus refers to himself as a, a BDFL, Benevolent Dictator for Life. Yeah. And he started giggling. He said, you know, that's one of the things that he says very often is, this is not a democracy. This is a dictatorship. He gets to decide. In, in, in how that's operated. And I think there's a very opinionated thread to how these projects are formed as well, is that people can submit content, but someone gets to choose what goes into the project, which you have to have. Yeah. And that's, again, quite different in some ways to how some open source projects happen. Yeah. Where there's a lot of, it's almost like a, everyone gets a vote in some projects. So, so as far as who they're targeting, they, they call them challenges when you sign up, and there's right. actually 16 of them. So they're targeting a pretty wide swath of things. It's everything from curation to acting to photography to cinematography to vocals to voice acting. So it's writing, screenwriting. It's a pretty wide swath of right. creative things. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, obviously for me as like a community doc, I think things like this are really cool. I love it when you have these collaboration platforms that genuinely work where you see really good results. Like GitHub and GitLab are brilliant like that, right? Um, so I, I was really impressed. I was I was not expecting to be impressed. I was expecting to come away like, oh, it was interesting, got to see a movie star, whatever. Right. But um yeah, I was I was I was pretty impressed by it. So So yeah, uh, hitrecord.com. Hitrecord.org. Oh dot org, sorry. Go check it out. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm not and, sure. It's... And that distinction is probably important. Yes. <laughs> you know, this, this being the point at all. Fools. Um, Fools. I'm, I'm just checking now. Hitrecord.com. Oh, it redirects. Oh, it goes to the same place anyway. Don't worry about it. Hey, um, I, wonder if we should, I wonder if we should do something on here for bad voltage. Well, uh, this 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 was the point of my question. I mean, it does seem to be slightly slanted. I mean, it's kind of, you know, anyone can do anything creative on there. But it's kind of lent a bit towards video. But I don't know whether that's just because it's the world he knows best, because he's a musician, because he's he's an actor and not a musician. 
but he's a director well, or a musician, whatever. For example, you know? something near and dear to your heart, uh, Eck, is poetry is one of the t- one of the items. Yeah. One of the 16 challenges. Um, it's yeah. Not, it's not clear to me how this is a collaborative activity, but I suppose uh, getting a poetry book published is an enormously collaborative activity, yeah. right? Uh, well, if what if you, you work with make editors a... and publishers and so on and so forth. Actually, writing poems, in my experience, one does on one's own. <laughs> in the armpit of a bad night. <laughs> yeah and the one thing that he mentioned which is i think important to mention here is that like some of the stuff on hit record has been on tv as well yeah which i think is quite cool yeah they talk about how people have earned two million dollars from it and so on and so forth so yeah yeah so So we should should do a thing have a think about it yeah we should do a thing so i think people who are listening go to community.badvoltage.org and maybe share some ideas for what we could do on hit record um, like maybe we could do, I don't know. We could do, a, you know, one thing that would be good is, which I have dreamed about from the beginning of bad voltage is animated bits of bad voltage segments. <laughs> that hot. would be cool. It would be cool. Harder than it looks. Having tried it's a lot Ricky harder. Gervais style. Right. Exactly. That would be, that would be awesome. hilarious. That would be but, hilarious. It, I, but that would actually be a cool thing to do. If, um, we, if we got together with an animator, but and this is the idea, right? We go, we want to do this. Can we find an animator? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I so think that would be. Maybe let's that do sh- it. Maybe that should let's be our it. thing. Let's do it. So I can't believe that we're a hundred shows in. This is very cool, and uh, I think it. You know, uh, it's been a fun ride so far on Bad Voltage. Um, should we keep going, or should we just like <laughs> just let it go? It now? <laughs> We've done it now. We're, we're, um, we're, um, does it count as a pod fade if? If you just go, right, we're finished now. Done 100 shows. Next show. <laughs> right. We could literally drop the mic, break the mic, say it's broken, we're out. Well, you know what? If I don't have to carry this giant Yeti mic back to San Francisco, that's fine with me. Which, by the way, looks like a huge dildo when it's on the X-ray scan. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I would like to point out, I believe you or one of you two was the first one to get the Blue Yeti. Spoke very highly of it as a travel mic. I acquired said Mike. It weighs one hundred pounds. <laughs> that that was Jonathan Bacon because I, ju- I was ju- I was just about to make exactly the same point. I mean, yes, I've got Blue Yeti, but it it has travelled. I think in total about twelve feet inside my flat. Right, it came out of the box <laughs> yeah. and it's on my desk. And because that's, that's as far as you could lift it. Yeah, because he still pulled his back. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> Monsieur A. Le Bacon was terribly effusive about how it's a brilliant travel mic and all this. And now when he actually has to travel with it, he whines about it constantly. It is it is he- it's a heavy I mean, it is a high-quality device for those of you yeah. who may have considered one because of our glowing recommendations. <laughs> yeah. Just not a travel mic. <laughs> I was here for four days. The entirety of my luggage weighs less than that mic. <laughs> <laughs> it is a brutally heavy mic. I mean, I feel like it's got like a nuclear reactor built into it or something like that. Cause it, I mean, it, but it, cause it's made out of freaking steel. So, and I was going to say, I have an actual studio mic at home. I have a Shure SM7. Yeah. Smaller and weighs less than that. That same here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I could put this on my boom because I think it just hit the ground <laughs> each time. Ah, yeah. well, my... And shake, shake the room as well. Yeah, it would. It would. <laughs> In fact, shake the room. My, my scissor arm that I've got my on... <laughs> Um, it explicitly says in the uh, the description of this thing, uh, uh, my scissor arm on Amazon, not for use with the Blue Yeti mic. Um, and it- then I looked at the comments and absolutely everyone went, I've got a Blue Yeti mic on it and it's fine. But, uh, which is why I bought it. I, I thought, well, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> so I bought it. But, and it has been fine, but I kind of see why they've said that because the scissor arm is not the most robust piece of equipment I've ever owned. And the mic is really, 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 really heavy. <laughs> so so I could see that one day I'm going to come in and you could have snapped the scissor arm in half or something, right? By the way, my comment about it being looking a bit like a, dild- a giant dildo in a suitcase was, was based on fact when the first time I traveled with it and I. I never ever check a bag unless I'm traveling anywhere with Jack, where we have to pack all of his crap into a into a check bag. I always just take hand luggage, and it went through the X ray, and I could I was like the only person in TSA pre, and my bag went through, and the guy on the X ray screen snickered, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and he said, "Is that a mic?" <laughs> and I was like. 
yes, it's a mic. <laughs> and he actually opened up the suitcase to just double check because it it's not a flattering thing on this. And I because he put he turned the screen around so I could see it. It it looks pretty. Um, yeah, the fact that he actually turned the screen around a little amusing, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, so I expect to have issues uh, whenever I when I travel with it because uh, it does look a bit you know sketchy. It does, but it no. does. Yep, yeah, so, so there you go, hundred shows. Are, are we gonna are we gonna buy an an iPhonics? <laughs> uh, well, um, only one of us uses an iPhone, right? It, it depends how much we make on hit record, right? <laughs> <laughs> Although I see that they what it's a nine ninety nine, but they also raised the price of Apple Care to like two hundred bucks. They did, so it's a twelve hundred dollar phone. What's worse, right? Right. Um, in I, there in the states, it's a thousand dollars, right? Nine hundred ninety nine dollars, which is about eight hundred and thirty euros, and uh, in Europe, it's eleven hundred and fifty nine euros. Which means it's actually cheaper, not kidding, to fly from here to New York, stay in New York for two nights in an Airbnb, buy an iPhone and fly back, than it is to just walk in the damn shop here. That is Mm. ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Also, uh, not sure about the face ID thing. (laughs) Is that the the thing where it it scans your face to... Log it, like, to, 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 to unlock the phone, yeah. And a whole bunch of people have been saying, you know, uh, faces are usernames, not passwords, and so on. And it's weird because did you see the the cop mode thing? No, no, well, I haven't um, seen anything. I, I no, I this, 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 faces are usernames. Yeah, right. this was this was um, uh, a couple of months ago, I think, rather than now. But the idea is that um, you could, you know, your phone can be unlocked with just a thumbprint. If you, it, yeah. you like, you tap the the home button five times or something like that, and it then goes into you have to now put a pin or a passphrase in, apart from making emergency calls. And exactly the idea behind this is so if you're going somewhere where they can legally require you to put your your thumb on the pad, uh, uh, but can't legally require you to divulge a password. Interesting. Then it's really easy to do that, which I thought was quite a clever idea. But, but now, yeah. they, but now, presumably they've got it so they can just take the phone and just hold it up to your face, and it unlocks. So well done. Yeah, the, I don't like the idea of the uh, face unlock thing. Uh, the worst thing about it is that um, if you get a corporate uh, iPhone, then you have to change your face every ninety days. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you see the point here, yeah, right? Upstage at the next <laughs> Apple uh, release event, I assume, <laughs> stewarding language. <laughs> right. But yes, no, it's entertaining. Um, so, uh, so that was a hundred shows. Brilliant. Um, it was. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for listening. For those, yeah, of yeah you absolutely. Been around. I, one thing I'd love to hear, actually, on the forum, um, is how long those of you who listen to the show have been listening since. Are, are many of you? I mean, don't lie, okay? <laughs> Uh, but how many of you have been listening, you know, when did you start listening to the show? I'm just curious how many of you have been with us for the entire journey or most of it. So, because we're uh, having a good time. And, I, yeah, uh, I started in show one. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, I started in show minus three. Yeah. We have the, unrele- the unreleased tapes. Oh, we tapes. do. God, we, we, have do. The un- we have the unreleased trial tapes. Have, have we still got them in? And then the little released episode zero, I believe. Right. Yeah. 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 I wonder if we, uh, maybe we'll publish that one day. Maybe we oh, won't. Well, actually, maybe, maybe, we'll pu- maybe, 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 maybe we'll publish it on Hit Record. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> and then suddenly the site, like the company, goes into administration. <laughs> <laughs> so. Right. Thank you very much. Right. It's been a great hundred shows. Here's to the yes. next hundred. Yes. <laughs> Indeed, we shall not pot fade. Bye, everyone. Bye.